when we were children, we were naturally uh, curious. Um, we were doing things that reflects our sense of curiosity and uh, sense of adventure. All right. And uh, some of the things that we do are actually uh, climbing, actually. If you recall, when you were small, you were running around here and there. You were climbing so far, kitchen cabinets and all that. Of course, mom and dad will say no, but that is what climbing is to me. It's a form of uh, self-expression and uh, I do it. I climb mountains because, <coughs> sorry, because um, uh, mountains have special meaning to me. And uh, I mean, to me, they are like huge, beautiful, powerful, and I also think they are the best teacher because you can be the fittest person on planet Earth, and the mountain can just defeat you just like that. I mean, they are so powerful. Um, it's a good ego check and it keeps you humble and uh, pursue the goal of life with the, with the sense of self-respect and uh, respecting the environment. <clears throat> so this talk is all about high altitude mountaineering. So a basic definition, what is a mountaineering? It's a sport hobby profession of ascending a mountain. Really basic, uh, for someone it can be a sport or a hobby. Um, for some, it can be a profession, like a mountain guide, for example, or even a geologist. A lot of geologists uh, do climb mountains to, 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 to study the mountain. Um, to me, it's more of a sport and hobby. Sport because I love uh, competing with other climbers. It's a healthy competition. And I do it, uh, I mean, it's a healthy competition in a good way. Who climb faster or who can reach the highest point. Uh, most number of peaks climb, just an example. Hobby because it's just something I love to do. Um, I enjoy doing it, so it's not like I don't feel it like an additional work. Uh, what is high altitude? High altitude is defined, uh, is categorized by scales that you can see there. High, very high, extremely high, and the dead zone. Uh, most of the peaks or mountains in uh, Alps or Southern Alps uh, fall under <coughs> the uh, fall under this uh, uh, high category and uh, the mountains in the Himalayas, for example, are usually very high, extremely high, all the dead zone. There are about 14 peaks in the world, uh, they, are about, they are actually 14 peaks in the world which is above that altitude, the dead zone above 8,000 meter high. Why is it called dead zone? Because uh, at this point, the human body completely stopped responding to altitude. Your physiology does completely stop. In fact, it reverses. Um, for example, uh, if someone were to take us and drop us on top of Mount Everest, uh, in half an hour's time, we'll be unconscious. In one hour or two hours, we'll be dead because uh, our body is not designed to be at that altitude. So how do climbers do it is the topic of my uh, presentation today. Um, Okay, um, why do I climb? What is my inspiration to climb? This is the reason why. Uh, to me, this is my mental picture, my mental image that I have it all the time at the back of my mind. Um, it's a kind of goal or passion. Or This picture summarizes what mountaineering is all about to me. It gives me a sense of power and drive. When I'm feeling down, I imagine this picture even if I don't climb and it just gives me a sense of uh, energy to, to keep going and doing something even if it's not climbing. Every person should have this kind of uh, power image which I call and uh, it's some sort of a recurring image that you have at the back of my mind. So it doesn't have to make sense, it's something that you imagine you're doing but the important thing is you can use this image to drive you towards your goal and overcome a lot of uh, obstacles. So this is what uh, that zone all about. This picture is on the, in the that zone. Um, this is an altitude to give you perspective. It's an altitude where um, the it's a cruising altitude of uh, uh, most jetliners. So you can see how high it is to be climbing here, especially without uh, using supplementary oxygen. <coughs> so what is what does it take to become a climber or mountaineer? Uh, obviously, the first thing you have to focus on in your fitness goal, um, you want to be start uh, slow. You want to take uh, the first thing you want to check is your aerobic conditioning. So for that, you want to be a lot of uh, doing a lot of endurance activities like running or cycling, 
And then uh, you take it up a further one notch, you do start doing anaerobic conditioning. Anaerobic is where you train your body to train with lack of oxygen and with a lot of uh, lactic acid. Lactic acid is where you have you exercise and you have burn in your muscles. That's where you get lactic uh, uh, acid accumulation. So you want to train yourself for mountains. You have to train yourself in this zone more than any other zone. But before you get there, it's all about being having a good aerobic capacity. Um, you want to pick up some skills um, that relate close to mountaineering, uh, which is rock climbing and ice climbing. Um, the good news is that you don't have to be super good in all these uh, skills uh, when you first started. You start small, um, you, for example, if you're running, maybe you start running 5 kilometers, 10 kilometers, and you take it from there. Uh, for climbing, it's the same. I know I used to be um, really bad at rock climbing when I first started. I used to struggle a lot uh, because lack of uh, upper body strength, and I had some balance problems, so I struggled a lot. But what kept me there, uh, kept me there is because um, I learned the skill a bit and then I find a small objective to climb and I apply it there, integrate the skills there. I come back, I learn more. So that goal of climbing a mountain actually which drive me to accumulate all other skills uh, and uh, become uh, good at them. Uh, other than fitness goals, you have to be uh, to be a good mountaineer. You need to be uh, learn about uh, the weather, the geology. Uh, you need to have a good orienteering skills so that you don't get lost um, in the mountains. And you also have to need to know a lot about medical and nutrition. It's so important. Um, I learned how to rescue people. I learned how to perform uh, minor surgery because sometimes you are out there on your own. You have to perform a minor surgery on yourself. It's possible. How you want to use the anesthetics and all that. So there are a lot of things, but you have to start with the basic, the fitness foundation make it on the small mountain and then gradually you want to go and do it on the high mountains. Um, okay, where do I climb? I've uh, climbed in uh, most of this range. As you can see, uh, most of the tallest peaks are here in Asia. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tian Shan mountain range, the Pamirs. Uh, I haven't climbed in Hindu Kush yet. It's in Af Afghanistan and it's a bit over uh, Pakistan. Uh, as uh, most of us know, Himalayan mountain range, which span across few countries, Tibet, Nepal, um, India, Pakistan, a bit of China, and Bhutan. So uh, most of the famous peaks, like you know, Everest are situated in the Himalayas. But what most people don't know or lack of uh, uh, exposure is the Karakoram mountain range, which is uh, situated here. As you can see, it's uh, situated uh, above the Himalayan range. In fact, it is the most uh, uh, isolated mountain range in the world. The weather here is far more uh, violent than in uh, Himalaya, and uh, the peaks uh, it is uh, it has the highest concentration of uh, uh, tall peaks in the world. So that is Karakoram Range, and it is it is also the most uh, glaciated region um, in the world. Um, it is uh, in fact it's more uh, it's the third most glaciated region outside the Arctic Poles. Uh, so the access to these mountains are far more difficult than to be climbing in Nepal, for example. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to rush you through uh, lots of slides actually. So pardon me, I, I can't stop too long in each slide. My idea is to show you what climbers go through in each expedition. So I'm about to show a bit of sample climbing uh, in Nepal, in Kumbu mountain range, in the Karakoram, and in Tibet. So um, I'm going to stop, uh, someone cue me uh, five minutes before the talk ends, so I won't, I'll be stopping. Um, showing you the slides, I want to talk a bit about uh, what it takes to be a mountaineer and the lesson that we learn uh, in mountaineering. Because I found out, I learned more about life in a two months expedition than the rest of uh, my life. So it's, it's really important. So please uh, cue me uh, five minutes before the talk ends. So, <clears throat> okay, first of all, uh, the first phase of climbing after you finish your training is the arrival to the, the, the city or, or the country where you want to climb. For Kumbu region, uh, for to climb in Nepal, Himalayas is Kathmandu. It's a beautiful city. Uh, okay, there we met this lady, a charming lady, Miss Elizabeth Holly. She's very famous among climbers because she was former journalist, American journalist, who arrived in Kathmandu in 1960s to document the uh, first of the first pioneering climb in the Himalayas. Fell in love with it. She decided to stay there and chronicle every major and significant events in. Uh, Himalaya. So we meet her for an interview before that particular climb in Nepal. 
Uh, this is a sample of the uh, permit, climbing permit that you have to get for every expedition. This example is uh, when we climb Mount Choyu, which is 8,200 meters high. It's in Tibet. So since uh, Tibet is under Chinese government, so we have to get the permission from the Chinese government. Uh, in, for, to climb in Karakoram, you have to go to Pakistan, Islamabad, beautiful city. And there you go to the Alpine Club of uh, Pakistan to get the uh, formality sorted. So we were having an interview with the, with the president then. And uh, uh, this is when I learned that I was the first Malaysian to, to actually enter the Karakoram range and uh, climb in a major expedition there. Okay, uh, the next phase is to approaching the mountain. From Kathmandu, we left to the nearest mountain village called Lukla with a uh, twin otter flight. It's a nice flight, beautiful view, but it's kind of scary because um, you have this uh, small plane flying through these big mountains on the side, the large valley and all that. So in case you're wondering how confident the pilot is. <laughs> <laughs> So don't worry, sir. the captain is actually uh, flying the pilot. As you can see, it's the very narrow strip. Um, very narrow strip. Uh, the plane has to land on there. So at the, at the end of the, the, the runway, so it's a huge drop down in the mountains. So the plane has to take off and land within the, the, the small strip. So it's the experience by itself. So there. Uh, it's the first track, so we start walking from now onwards, camping on every stop, slowly acclimatizing to the altitude. Uh, playing Sepa Takro, I have the habit of introducing Sepa Takro to every climbers when I travel. It gets popular really fast. Uh, typical trekking scene in Nepal. Namche Bazaar. Uh, this is a helicopter crash in Namche Bazaar. It's, it's not uncommon uh, in Nepal to see this kind of crash because helicopter uh, can operate, the service ceiling is about five or 6,000 meters. So it's very common for helicopter to crash there. It's very risky to take a helicopter. So when you're stranded in the mountain, you want to call for rescue, you have to think uh, twice whether you really need the helicopter because the pilot will be putting himself, his life, his own life uh, in risk if to rescue you. So we decided to camp there, it's a nice spot. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, I think we got too curious, we waited until the night because there were army all around it. So we <laughs> sneak in into the heli uh, helicopter and play with it. Um, then we went for a hike in there, we saw the first view of our objective for the climb, Mount Amber de Blum. This peak is so famous because um, it is far more technically challenging than to climb it than to climb Mount Everest. In fact, you find a lot of Everest veterans having problem uh, climbing this mountain. The late Sir Edmund Hillary once described this mountain as unclimbable. So that's our first view of uh, the objective. A close-up view of the peak, of the top portion of it. Um, on the way, we saw this signboard. If you're going to the Everest base camp, there's no way you'll get lost because you see signboard like this. So it's that much easier to climb, uh, to track in Nepal. Uh, but we were not going there. We were headed to Amada Blum Base Camp. That's the base camp. Base camp is a semi-permanent uh, spot where you do all your uh, arrangement, you uh, pitch your tent, you set up your communication. So it's like your temporary home while you're coming, climbing the mountain. What do you do in the base camp? You mostly do nothing. You just <laughs> relax, <laughs> yeah, gain some energy before you go for the climb. Uh, then you eat, you eat a lot. This is the only time you're allowed to eat uh, everything that uh, your doctor said don't eat because you need to put up the, uh, the calorie and it's important to have uh, hire a good cook. We had an excellent cook that cook uh, nice meals because from this point onwards, you, it's all about climbing your own. You're self-sufficient. You have to carry your own food um, in the, in the dif difficult uh, climb. And nutrition is so important in mountaineering. I have experimented. Uh, when you carry food up in the mountain, it's important to be lightweight. Uh, the most important is good to eat, sedap. So, and a lot of calorie and lightweight and easy to cook because it takes approximately one hour to, to boil and drink a water up there. So it's that difficult to cook. So it's important. I've experimented with all kinds of food from freeze-dried freeze sambal to uh, Japanese quail eggs, but nowadays I just stick with the uh, Maggi Mee because it's cepat dimasa and sedap dimakan. <laughs> <laughs> so next, next we uh, arrange our gear before the climb, we test the gear. Uh, we do a puja ceremony because the Sherpa believe for uh, you to get blessing from the uh, mountain uh, god before you go climbing it. 
in Tibet is more different approach, our land approach to into Tibet, Nepal, uh, that is the uh, Nepal border, and this is China, or uh, Tibet. Uh, it's called Kodari Highway, but I think it's a misnomer because the road looks like this, and there's a lot of uh, landslide along the way. When, once you enter Tibet, it looks like this. It's beautiful, it's flat, so you can have a road all the way which goes to the base camp. Uh, first climbing, uh, camping spot in Tingri, that is the mountain that we climb, Mount Choyu, uh, 8,200 meters. Um, Again, the Sepata Crow thing in Tibet with a different theme, this one. So, and finally, the, the, the base camp, uh, the advanced base camp of Mount Choyu. This is our semi permanent home. This from here, we start uh, climbing to the, to the summit. Back to Karakoram, it's a slightly different. You still fly to the nearest mountain city, but it's far more scarier because uh, instead of small plane, you're using a big Boeing 737. Uh, the pilot didn't say a word uh, when he fly until he landed, so we figure out he fully concentrating on how to fly. Or reading newspaper, we wouldn't know because it's closed. Okay, then uh, make a sharp bang. Uh, this is my favorite picture because uh, it's a mountain is there. Uh, you can see the Karakoram Highway, a famous Karakoram Highway. And I love this picture because it represents two of the things I love most, uh, the mountains and also the aircraft engines, which is my profession. Um, Skardu, this is the first mountain city uh, that you arrive uh, from here. You start our land journey towards the mountain, nice view. Uh, first uh, uh, travel is by jeep. Um, okay, um, halfway I saw this signboard and I got excited. K2, right? So look at the eagerness on my face. But if you, any of you read Arabic or Urdu, what, what does it really say is actually, is there a, kef, a K2 cafe is there, so come and eat. So, <laughs> so we make a pit stop. And the, the road scene in Karakorm is, is like this. It's always get washed away by river and all that. So it's a serious uh, four-wheel drive uh, experience to get through this. Uh, first part of the trekking, you can see the porters uh, carrying on supplies. They are the main, uh, without them we can't achieve this climbing because we need to uh, go to the mountain carrying all our loads. Uh, the track looks like this. Unlike Nepal, the, in Karakoram is a very difficult track. There's no proper trail and it's really steep and dangerous. First view of the mountain, the Trango Group. I was jokingly showing the summit of uh, the Trango Tower. It's, it's my future objective to climb. Uh, first, uh, glacier. So from here onwards, it's about uh, 10 days walking on ice, nothing but ice and rock. Um, the, the trail is very difficult, slippery, you'll be walking, trekking, carrying heavy load uh, on the ice, all the way to the base camp. Uh, it's a sign to show that there's no life can survive here. Uh, closing to the mountain. Okay, since you can't build a bridge, right, so there is no soil. There's no ground, so it's all ice, so you are forced to jump through glacial stream and all that. I call this the leap of faith. It's showing my friend trying to jump over the... And it's all ice here, actually. It looks... Uh, there are small gravels and rocks, but it's all on the ice, so it's a bit unstable. More trekking towards the mountain, and finally in Concordia. Uh, this place has been described as the most beautiful spot on planet Earth, because from here you can view all the top peaks, the great peaks like K2, uh, broad peak is over here, and on this side is the Gashabrum range. We took a group photo, more trekking to the base camp. Uh, we're having a lunch spot, it's a good weather, so we had it outside. One day before we reached the base camp, the porters start dancing. So we figured out that, okay, from this point onwards, it's becoming easy, and they were so grateful that they made it safe. Um, it was not long uh, before we joined. Terrible dancing, I know. But we were, we were happy to, to reach the base camp. Uh, more view. And finally, the base camp of uh, Gashabom. Okay, now the climbing portion of it. Back to Nepal, Mount Ambadamblam. This is the route that we took. Um, advanced base camp. So I'm just going to rush through the, the slides and we can. Camp 1. Uh, climbing from Camp 1 to Camp 2, a bit of rock climbing, a bit of ice. More rock climbing. Okay, um, this climb, uh, for any of you, this rock climbing is about 6A plus difficulty. But at that altitude, it feels so difficult climbing the heavy uh, pack like this and wearing uh, thick boots. So these are the boots you can see. Like this. 
And with the crampon, it makes it so difficult to climb there. More climb, now it's more about ice and rock climbing. It's really steep and slippery, and uh, uh, the only consolation that you have a nice view. And finally, camp two. Uh, on this mountain, there are, there are really no flat spot to camp, so it's all about camping on these uh, uh, spots like this. If you're a sleepwalker, and you know how to untie a rope, not a place to be because you're just going to fall off if you do that. So you're even tied to the rope, even when you're sleeping. So more climbing towards uh, Camp 3, uh, above Camp 2. More climbing. OK, uh, if you can see this uh, ice, this glacier over here, right? OK, we are very close to the summit. Uh, by close, I mean in this mountain, it took us about seven hours to reach the summit from this point onwards. So all vertical climbing. But it's important, when you're here, you're really tired. Every step, every step, you breathe 20 times and your ankle burns because you'll be balancing on that book and the crampon on the ice and the snow and it just keeps going on and on. So at this point, I, I, had, I had this picture of uh, the big picture of where am I um, in, the, in the climb. So we were actually here from the previous picture. You can see this is the top portion of the climb. So we were here. So it takes another uh, seven hours to reach the summit. I'll never forget this climb because I, I had a serious uh, complication. I reacted to a, a painkiller which I took two weeks earlier when I had a twisted ankle. So it started, I couldn't eat properly, so I climbed with half a liter of water and uh, I probably just ate like half of uh, energy bar. Uh, so climb was difficult. I actually skipped camp tree. I climbed all the way, so it was an 18 hours climb non-stop. Uh, Every climb, at every point, I forced myself to, to remember my name. It was so difficult. I don't want to lose concentration, so I don't want my brain to shut down. So I keep recalling uh, the names of my loved uh, people who I love, my family, friends, um, and even doing like simple mental arithmetic to make sure that your brain keeps active. So that's the struggle to reach the, the, the summit of it. At the top, when I reached the top, I only had two minutes before the weather, uh, the weather closed in. Um, so that's what mountaineering is all about. It's not about reaching the summit. The success is actually the whole journey, how you plan, how you participate in the climb and all that. So two minutes, I had to rush back, and it's the best view I got from top when the weather was clear. Thank you. And uh, coming down, reaching the top is only halfway, and you have to make sure you come back safe to meet all the people that you love, right? So it's another work. Coming down this mountain is really crazy. You'll be rappelling uh, using the rope, coming down in the dark, and the rope is slippery because icy, and you, you can't lose a si single uh, moment of uh, concentration. OK, uh, that's finished with the Nepal thing. And now it's a quick uh, overview of climb in the Gashabrum range. Uh, that was in Pakistan, which I showed you the pictures there. We started way down here. From Islamabad, the, so the track, us, the track took us to base camp. And from here, it, it, the climb starts, and all the way to the 8,000 meter, and back. And as you can see, the way back is far more uh, dangerous and steep to get back to the civilization. OK, the first obstacle is the hard one, actually. It's an ice fall. Uh, ice fall is basically a frozen waterfall. The ice keeps moving, it's not stable, and it's, a, it's like a maze of huge block of ice. And in this mountain, it's unlike Mount Everest in Kumbu Icefall, uh, because it's so commercialized. You have ropes, you have ladders, so you, there's no way you get lost. Over here, you have to plan your own journey, you have to find your way out the ice, and it took us seven hours just to get through the icefall to the next uh, flat ground for camping. So I was in charge of leading one of the team, and it was really scary because uh, you have to climb at like 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, and when you climb, you take one step, and you hear like this, and you know the sound comes from deep below. Something is cracking up and giving away. So you have to make sure you don't put step in the wrong place and end up in a crevasse, and which will be very difficult. Uh, so more climbing in the, in the ice fall. It's really slippery because we climb in the, in, in the morning before the sun. Uh, and this is how crevasse uh, looks like. So you have to make sure you don't end up there. Um, so you have to find your way around the maze of uh, crevasse. It's really tricky, especially the weather. It's like this. You get snow. If you don't judge your trail well, you might step on it and fall, ins fall inside. So this is uh, another leap of faith. This is how we cross uh, the crevasse. 
uh, it shows you uh, the network of Krevos before you reach Cam 1. So you can see it's a bit tricky to, to, to get over this. Cam 1, finally, from here we start more steep climbing, uh, arranging our stuff, cooking, having uh, food. This is before we did the camp to climb to camp two, which is just above that rich uh, small flat ground. Some part of the section we fix our own rope, a temporary fixture, so that we can haul our supplies up to the camp. It's really a tedious process. More steep climbing up the southwest ridge. Uh, this is me doing the leading uh, towards camp three. Uh, this part is really tough because the snow. Every step you take, the foot goes inside the snow like this, and. Everything burns, like every breath you take is like a fire burning your lungs and you have to keep reminding yourself to keep going and going and going and you think about your teammates, how they trust you and all that. So it's really tough. Uh, more picture of climb and finally camp two. Uh, this was about 6,900 meters like this. More climbing towards camp three after one day rest. Uh, this is the avalanche. You can see it's uh, in this mountain. There are a huge risk of avalanche. So this is where we were climbing uh, one day before. So that shows you how, how dangerous it is to to climb here. Uh, towards Camp Tree, this is now is the dead zone already. So you can see two climbers here on the verge of uh, collapsing because it's, it's really hard. Uh, there is me climbing up there. Something, uh, a small accident happened at the top of this uh, ice fall. And I was going out, there's another climber from a different team ascending, uh, retreating. And I could see he was about to uh, lose his footing. And I was tired, I, I couldn't prepare myself. But I know that accident about to happen. True enough, he slipped, he fell. We were hanged on to one tiny piece of rope. Uh, he fell down and uh, I managed to catch him. Uh, I don't know how I did it, but somehow his crampons, which are what you wear at the, with your shoes, this stuff was like this, at the end of that. I was already tired and uh, I thought I would give, off, uh, give up because uh, I, catched, I catched him with my hand and I thought I broke my arm and my ankle because it was a steep ground. Um, it's, it, it's just feels so bad at that time. So, but as a climber, with the experience, we, we took like two minutes to breathe. He was shaken, I was shaken. Uh, took two minutes, we found a way to untangle him, make sure he, he get his energy back, goes down. I was really tired at that point. But from experience, even though I panicked, I didn't um, let the panic uh, stop me from going. I know there's a thing called adrenaline rush. It happens when you when you fall down and when you have fear or something like that. What happens is all the, the, the system fires up temporarily and you get this sort of energy. I knew that I can use that adrenaline just to take a few steps up and see what happened. And that's what I did. Um, that's what I did. So after 10 steps, I realized, okay, it's not, it's not so bad. I can, I can uh, keep doing this. I, then with the difficulty of the climb, I quickly forgotten what happened, so I kept going. So a small view like this, all the way up. It's never ending climb, about five hours on the steep ground. Uh, more steep climbing on the ice fall camp tree, finally. You can see my uh, teammate just uh, collapsed because it was tough. When we reached there, we, we thought, and the next day we plan to do a summit, uh, the summit uh, uh, thing. And we were in the tent, and I took this picture because the storm sets in that night. And in the in the Karakoram Range, in, when you're climbing in these mountains, the wind can be really uh, ferocious. It can be really difficult when you're up there. And uh, I wasn't sure if I will be alive, or at least I have the same uh, face tomorrow. So I took the picture to to. <laughs> I don't know, it's just tough. So more climbing towards Camp 4, the last camp before the summit. Uh, it's a temporary camp actually, so we normally stay there two, three hours, boil some water. And if you're wondering why there is no snow, even though it's high up, it's because this place uh, is where the wind uh, attacks. Like it's the first place where the jet stream hits the mountain. That's why all the snow is being blown off. It's the altitude where, if you know about high altitude uh, ballooning, it's the altitude where people uh, take their high altitude balloon and use the jet stream to, to, to move forward. So the wind can be that strong, if it picks up, you'll be blown away just, just like that. So, so here is speed is safety. You're tired, but you have to force yourself to climb faster and faster. 
Uh, this is a view from top. And uh, we are now, by now, we are higher than all the other mountains. Uh, finally, Camp 4, the last bit before summit, temporary uh, climb. This is totally dead zone. Uh, it's very difficult to breathe here. You have a constant headache. Uh, I don't know how to relate to this. Let's say if you drink alcohol, it's the feeling when you have the worst hangover ever you can imagine. That's how you feel up there. And if you don't drink, think about uh, when the time when you are dehydrated severely or having a food poisoning, that's how you feel. You can't eat, eating one, uh, one, taking one sip of water takes too much energy there because the body actually is shutting down some of its function to preserve the core temperature. So that's, and, and then the, the, the oxygen that breathes, you breathe here is about one third of what we are breathing now. So it's really, everything is difficult. The movement is slow, one step, 50 breath, next step, 50 breath. And even though the summit looks clear, it's so on the other side, um, it will normally take about 12 to 16 hours of non-stop climb to be up there. Uh, so we were going up, the weather started picking up. In Karakoram, uh, the weather changed really fast. Unlike in Nepal, uh, let's say you want to climb Mount Everest, you will have about, uh, it's not uncommon to have one week of, uh, uh, one week of a weather window, a nice clear window, so you can plan your summit, you can come back. In Karakoram, it's about two or three days maximum. And the weather is so unpredictable. We were near the summit, about 200 meters high. The weather hits, the jet stream hits. Um, so we were stuck there. It's a hard decision. If you keep containing out, you'll be blown off the face of the mountain. So it made a team decision to, to retreat just 200 meters from the top. Tough call after all the thing. We were stuck. There was no trail. There's no rope. Everything was... Uh, taken down by ice fall and avalanche. So we have to climb way down without using rope on some section. Snows were up to here, sometimes here. So it's pure uh, survival. It's my teammate. You can see the snow is there. Can't see anything, but you have to judge your skill or experience in uh, mountaineering to do that. Uh, somehow we got down safe to the uh, above, uh, below camp too. Uh, luckily there was some rope there, so we used that rope to ascend down. When we got down, it's, it's all uh, things have changed. We have to find a new path toward the ice fall. Uh, the ice has cracked up. You can see the glacial stream. Uh, that's a base camp. It looks different than when we left. As you can see, I told you there's no soil. So the ice has cracked up. So the camp were about to go inside. Luckily, we arrived uh, before that happened. So we packed up and we left. So the, the hard part is not over yet, actually, because the way back, as I told you, is more difficult than the trek in. So this is uh, how you track down. It's a block of ice and slippery. You don't have the crampons with you because it's a track. So you have to make sure you don't fall down. More view of how the track looks like. It's all ice and glacier, glacier superhighway. Uh, this is where we have to cross uh, one pass, which is about 5,700 meters, really dangerous pass. And you have to cross it before the sun hits because when the sun hits, it's going to melt all the uh, snow and ice and you're going to release all these small rocks and big rocks and it's going to fall down on you when you make a descent. So you have to do it in uh, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. That's how crossing the pass is. Uh, there's no rope here, so you have to uh, use uh, just a small support, like a temporary rope, which is not, not stable. One mistake, you will uh, slip down into that crevice. Uh, this is how we go down. Uh, the Ropes were slippery, there's no, we don't have any climbing equipment, so it's all just holding on to the rope, which is icy. So it was really tough for a track back. Finally, after two and a half months, I saw the first grass. I was so happy uh, at this point. Uh, but we had more tracks to go on, but from this point onwards, it's, it's, um, it's easier. Finally, we arrive in uh, Islamabad, so we have to debrief uh, the Alpine Club, the committee of uh, the expedition that we did and all that. Uh, what I didn't mention was there's a lot of military presence in uh, Karakoram Range. The reason being it's a sensitive zone because uh, it's between um, Pakistan, China, uh, and India. So, so that's one thing. Do I have time? It's okay. Um, I know I have to I have to rush through all the slides, 
But uh, I would like to tell you, which is uh, some things which are far more important than actually being on the mountain, things that I've, I've learned personally. All these years, I had a hard time to figure out or put it into words, what did I learn? But I knew that I improved so much in my other areas of life because of these things. So I picked up three things that, or four things which I've, I've learned from uh, mountaineering. First is, uh, first of all, the misconception that climbers are fearless. It's not true at all. In fact, uh, if I'm not, if I'm fearless, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I would have fall down in uh, some crevice, attempting some stupid thing. So what does it mean is that um, our sense of curiosity, we, we let our natural self to be curious and adventurous to, to guide us. So that's what happened to us. We let us to be curious. In fact, we have the fear just like everyone else. It's just that instead of using the fear to avoid it, we use it to our advantage. When we are climbing, we use the fear as a friend. It's a fear to remind us how we have to be careful. We have to go, but you have to be careful. So hence, all the careful planning, all the logistics and all the uh, contingency planning in mountaineering. So it's all about taking calculated risk. Secondly, uh, there's a beautiful uh, Japanese uh, philosophy called Sashin, which I practice. Um, this is good because what you say, Sashin is uh, basically uh, looking everything through a beginner's, with a beginner's mind, which means you can be doing something repetitively for so long, but you can see it with the beginner's mind or you can see it with expert mind. An expert look at it and say, oh, I've done this. It's no big deal. A beginner look at this in a cautious way. He or she is more open to learn something from their experience. Doesn't matter how many times you have done something, always approach things with a beginner's mind. It gives you a sense of humility and you are humble and you open your mind to more uh, new learnings or experience. So that is Sashin. Uh, finally is the comfort zone. Uh, comfort zone is a very simple concept. Um, but it's really, really powerful. In fact, I will say it's the single most uh, thing that decides whether a, a climber can make it to their big, uh, make a big objective like this. Um, comfort zone is how you, how you frame your life or perspective of how you see things. Uh, for example, if you look at, uh, let's say you all know about Spider-Man, right? The guy who has climbed buildings without ropes and all that. People look at him and think he's mad out of his mind, right? Okay, sure, some people give him a award and say, wow, you're great, man. But back in their mind, they still think he's crazy, right? So because what he does is something that most people cannot uh, imagine doing. But being a climber, I can strongly relate to him. He's a really good climber. How I relate is that his comfort zone, it's all in the comfort zone. He's the man who have realized uh, the power of comfort zone and he worked his way up from having the comfort zone, this is your comfort zone, from having a big comfort zone. In other words, he's more comfortable doing uh, crazy things like that than, than other people do because he has worked daily to increase his comfort zone. Most of us are always comfortable being in a comfort zone because that's what we used to do. When we do a new things or challenging things, it's basically breaking the boundaries. It's basically increasing the comfort zone. So it can be intimidating, like for example, you want to climb a big mountain like this, it can be intimidating, especially if you don't have any experience climbing. But don't let that put you off. I never had experience climbing before I take up this uh, big objective, but I laid out the plans, how can I go about doing that? So I realized the secret behind, behind actually breaking that comfort zone is actually practicing this concept called avoiding the micro avoidance. What is micro avoidance? Um, I read somewhere that we have about 16 thoughts per day. Thoughts, right? So let's say you uh, awake about 16 hours. So every hour you have hundreds of thoughts. Okay, you want to think about doing this, but what happens is we train ourselves to avoid these desires or thoughts. It can be as simple as, let's say, I, I want to, uh, okay, let me, let me think about, uh, okay, let's say I want to shave today, right? I want to have a nice, five o'clock shadow for tomorrow. Then I think my second thought, okay, I'm, I'm lazy, I can do it later. So I dismiss that, I avoid that. All these things are actually really powerful. So train, if one single thing you can do right now to go towards your goal is actually going towards avoiding uh, the micro avoidance. So you want to train from today, from now onwards, when you have a simple thought yourself, train yourself to go and do it regardless. 
So at the end of the day, you'll be so happy you accomplish a goal, and that gives you the habit towards moving uh, to a big goal like that. So, so thank you.